So my name is Jess Collins uh, and I run something called the Birmingham Music Archive which is uh, an online archive which seeks to celebrate Birmingham's rich music heritage and I do that because I don't think in the city uh, either ourselves or uh, the city's agencies celebrate it enough and if you think about Manchester or Liverpool you know music is very endemic in the, in the way they sell their city and talk about themselves so I, I'm trying to change that slowly uh, I also uh, have made films around reggae, punk and bhangra and do a lot of other types of exhibitions and installations around music heritage and music history. I also work at Birmingham City University where I write about these things not as eloquently, uh, I have to say, as, as Owen's book is, but I write about them and publish them. And it's been a great honour to be uh, asked to do this tonight because one of the things that I think is missing is the voice of individuals uh, often, if you look at the, the, the book, uh, sorry, the sports and the book, music books here, uh, you know, they're the stories are told often, you know, there's Ronnie Stone, there's Sex Pistols, well, we know those, and they're important, but often the voices of people like Owen and others in this room are often left out. And so one of the things I am really keen about is to hear and to encourage those voices to be heard and to be celebrated and to be recognised and say, actually, the contributions of people like Owen and others are really important to the city. It's how we understand ourselves, it's how we understand the city, and we have to look at the impact, in this case, of, of Owen and particularly black music has made to the city's offer. So it's really great that you've, you've done this. Uh, I think this is a really rare occasion to have a book uh, about one, uh, Birmingham and black, the black experience in Birmingham and also about the music of Birmingham uh, and I was just looking before and I've read, I don't know if people have read Lloyd uh, uh, Bradley's brilliant book about uh, the sounds of London, 100 years of black music in London which is a great voice and I think this is what hopefully the first of many that will come from Birmingham to stand in that, uh, in that canon. So uh, that's me, I want to say thank you to Grace and the Waterstone staff for uh, putting us on tonight. I want to say thanks to Richard uh, from Tangents, who was here, and uh, he seems to have gone, oh, there he is, uh, who's the publisher uh, for, for publishing this. And also thanks uh, to Mike uh, for you know, being a true believer in reggae and you know, at his own expense often uh, putting out some really fantastic music that otherwise would have been lost forever. So it's really good to that. But most of all, I want to thank Owen for, for writing the book. Uh, the format is going to take, I'm going to, I've read the book a few times, and I think there's some themes that come out of that, and if it's okay with Owen, I'm going to sort of couch the conversation in the themes that I think uh, that come out, and we'll have a, a, a conversation about that. And the themes when I read the book uh, were, and I, these are just loose themes, but family, uh, sort of racism, daily racism, casual racism, uh, school <coughs> and growing up, the community, and that could be the black community, the music community, the local community, music obviously, Sports, and I was quite pleased to see that we're in the sports uh, section as well, which seems to play a big role in Owen's life. And uh, I've, I've titled it religion, but I mean religion and spirituality um, uh, through, through music and through Owen's life. So that's the sort of things we're going to explore. At any point, if people want to ask a question, put your hand up because uh, you're, much more, you're much more interesting than me. Uh, so don't uh, be afraid, just stick your hand up and I'll come and get, uh, ask you to say your point or your question. So without much further ado, I'm going to try and sit down. Owen, uh, what made you want to write the book? <coughs> Firstly, let me say good evening and thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I'm hugely embarrassed. <laughs> um, again, writing the book, I had a lot of support. Um, a lot of kind people who offered their help to me. It wasn't all my work. Despite appearances, lots of mistakes, typos, the typo key. Um, I wrote the book as was st stated at the beginning because I was asked, so it made it really easy. In terms of what we had to achieve writing about Birmingham and writing about the music, I was there. I think the era that we grew up in was probably far greater, far better than any of the other era since. I said there are things not in the book which I can remember. I mean, writing just keeps coming, it doesn't stop. <laughs> um, but our era, you know, I think, as I've heard a commentator on one of those Lovers Rock films say, when we used to go out, we used to go out to be together. Whereas I think nowadays people dance individually and they don't dance so much. So for me, the music and the whole Lovers Rock era, combined with the the whole 
from Jamaica thing. You know, um, you hear it coming out as I go. I don't speak English for very long. That could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so. I know you said you find it easy, but as someone who has to write and finds it really difficult, what was the process of writing? Did you, I mean, literally, did you sit down and things would come to you, or did you write and then go back and reflect? Did it take you long? How did you actually write the book? Um, it was about music. For me, the music here is in my life. My mum bought me and my brother an amplifier. I've still got it. When we was nine, K has got a catalog. <laughs> Bass guitar, bought me a triple guitar. That was the beginning. I think in the book I've talked about when my sister used to go piano lessons to this pastor man on the road that was next to ours. And she would come home and she would be practicing and I would just play what she played without practicing. It seemed simple. Church. Everybody knows about mm -hmm. church in here. So. <laughs> We won't go into the music of the church, but I love music. Music has always been, it's always been there, you know. Um, and it continues to be there, you know, you know I love it still. Uh, at the back, you might need to just bring the mic a little bit closer. Sorry. Yeah, Mike's got his hands up. Um, you, you mentioned in the, in the first couple of pages uh, that it was, um, it was hard and painful. And what, what did you mean by that? It's, it's in the very early stages. You said it was quite difficult for people for memories and etc. Is that, that difficult to overcome? I think <clears throat> anyone who's tried to trace their family history uh, or talk to family members about stuff in the past finds barriers. You know, there are some stories that just don't seem to make sense, or so you can't get the beginning or you can't get the end. In most instances, you just have where we are. I mean, in this room. My big cousin Joyce is there. She's always been there my whole life. Um, and it doesn't really transcend that generation. My mum's there. It's not mum. My mum's 95, she's oh, over here. What?
go space and to go home. My mom's always there, like I said. I used to say to my mates, I could come in. My mom's a morning person. I'm a morning person. Everybody else used to be sleeping at four or five o'clock in the morning, but my mom wouldn't be and I wouldn't be. So I think in the early years, we had a relationship, a morning relationship that no one else had. My brother was always sleeping. Um, my sister was sleeping, but my mom used to go to work six o'clock in the morning, start at six. She'd be up at four. I'd wake her up and we would, that's my memories anyway. So, you know, I've always been a morning person. I'm at my best in the morning. Um, Your mum was a great cake maker. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't get this big without the cake. <laughs> so, so family was really important, to you, particularly your mother, in terms of you know, guiding you through life. Would that be a fair thing to say? I think the morals that I have come from my parents. So the values and the... Um, you know, honesty. I remember my dad trying to batter me for doing things occasionally when I was young. Always with good intention in mind, saying, you know, don't do this or you're going to jail. Don't do that or, you know, not battering me physically, but just kind of always on about stuff when I was being adventurous or experimental. Um, my mom is a church going there. Uh, we grew up in the church, Gibson Road. I'm going to talk about it. the other churches were all rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were boring. To be honest, we used to go to the church on Whitten Road every Sunday morning. That's enough about that. That's, I've got that later on. <laughs> so you might want to skip that one as well. So, and I wonder if you could just uh, talk a little bit about how it was in England and in Birmingham for your mom and dad and, and that generation. Because you come to England, you talk about the coldness and other people spent to you know, first of all, did you make it so cold and wanted to go home? And what other things did they face at that period in, in, in uh, the UK, and particularly in Birmingham? Uh, I don't know, she's over there, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> the story she's told me, like I said, are the ones that I've written about, some of them anyway. Um, obviously, like I said, that whole tenant, being a tenant in people's multi, house, house is a multi, multiple occupation. So for many Caribbean families, they came to someone and it would often be in a rented room situation. I imagine I wasn't there. Um, my mom said she lived at various places. Some of them surprised me. I thought we'd always been in Ashton, as you do, it starts where you <coughs> But, you know, my mom moved around. Uh, I met my father here. My mom came with her whole tribe, I'm not gonna say family, we have a tribe more than a family. And similarly, my father's side, again, was an extensive family, so the two families came together. I think that coming together was more, in Jamaica they have a parish called St. Anne, yeah. and then my dad goes from St. Peter. Yeah. So as a result, I think everybody from St. Anne's mm -hmm. <laughs> became a part of the family and everybody from St. Elizabeth similarly and I think that would be echoed in most Caribbean families it tends to be the whole community that gets married in yes. them days anyway is that, is that still the same today or is that been uh, anybody married <laughs> just a married <laughs> <laughs> um, there was something on page uh, just to show I've written or read the book I think it's page 24 you mentioned um, Pardoners, and you just talked about multi house occupancy. I'd never heard this phrase before, and I just wondered if you could just explain a little bit more what, what pardoners were. Okay, I think nowadays they call them credit unions. Okay. <laughs> but for, at least from my mum, I mean, what I've picked up over the years for Caribbean people when they initially arrived, the banks and building mm. societies weren't for them in terms of affording them loans, so they, I'm not sure if they prosecute them or they create it, but if you find any black community, they would have a partner mm -hmm. system. I think in most Asian communities, they have a similar system mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that runs now. So for new communities uh, <laughs> don't necessarily understand how to use the system or the system at that time wasn't ready for Jamaicans to be borrowing money. I think the partner system became a fundamental way of people accumulating money. So they put 
in as little as a ten, ten pound every mm. week and jewelry a few hundred weeks later and be a <laughs> and then you'll finish to do something so positive. Well, that led me on to a couple of pages later, you talk about entrepreneurs in the black community as well. And it struck me that, you know, that was a form of entrepreneurship. And again, I just wanted to sort of push you a little bit and say what sort of entrepreneurship was going on. And it could have, you know, it could have been any type of that, but again, just a little bit of explanation of what you meant by, uh, by black entrepreneurs and what were they were doing. Right, entrepreneurs. I think everybody knows reggae music came from Jamaica. When the guys here built sound systems, they didn't build them purely for entertainment. There was a method to the madness. Um, the house we lived next door was bedrooms upstairs, dance hall downstairs. So when I went in there when I was two, three, four, um, it was just an empty room with massive sound boxes. Now, Jamaican communities, like I said, the guys went to work and then they came home, they, my mom, my mom is baker, hairdresser. <laughs> I mean, they were multi-talented and multifaceted, and they would have networks. You know, my mom, we did weddings every, I'm not sure who was getting married. All I can remember is going to weddings and lots of cakes in the house all the time. Um, but that was the way the community works. Uh, as now, Caribbean people like Caribbean food. So I imagined anybody who was an absolute genius could made a lot of money. The discos, as now, like I said, the DJ is a big thing now. In them days, England wasn't ready for it, but the Jamaicans came with the base and this every week get together. <coughs> they couldn't really go to clubs and pubs, as my son. You know, they live in clubs and pubs. It's free for them. They have no concept of going to battle in town. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's my mate Errol. He can tell you about the battles in town. Yeah. Mm. And that was just um, the colour bar. Yeah, that's just for being black and wanting to go out mm. and have a night out in real terms. So, Caribbean communities invented their own recreation mm. that sort. And for the person who was keeping it, obviously, it would be lucrative. Yeah, yeah. And so it was a way. So that entrepreneurship through again through music and just taking the community and the community responding. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dance halls were packed. If you you know charge a small sum, two thousand, mm. you're making a lot of money, mm. and you have mega sounds man, that started back then, and they've continued up until today. The big ones, Jashaka and all mm. these London ones, the giants. You know the music drives the community. Mm. You go to church, there's music. As I said, no one wants to go to a boring church. Mm. Everyone wants to go where the music is tight. Um, and in everything, if you go to christenings, weddings, in the house, <laughs> just music, we surrounded by music after. And was music a way of uh, remembering or having a link back to Jamaica? Is that one of the reasons that we so relevant in the I'm not from Jamaica. Oh. You know, maybe she can answer that question for you. But I assume, like I said, our parents wanted the latest beats that were happening in Jamaica, so the music. You know, someone would go, in those days people went to Jamaica for six weeks. It wasn't like 10 day trips like you can do now. It was a six week thing. A man would go with three suitcases, come back with two full of room and one full of records. <laughs> and that would normally be the way. And that was a business and an enterprise. My mum goes to Jamaica. She fills her suitcase with food from England and comes back from Jamaica with a different suitcase filled with Jamaican food. So, my mum used to go back to Ireland and bring Pochine and the records weren't as good as the, uh, the ones from Jamaica. But, um, so I just want to talk a little bit about, before we go to music, about school and sort of growing up. And I was uh, intrigued, and you probably know this, but you went to the Prince of Darkness's first school, Ozzy Osbourne at Albert Street. And then it seems to me after you left there, you had a, a bit of a mixed time at school. Uh, you had the Great Bar, uh, where it was predominantly white and there was you faced a lot of racism. And then the second part of... of Going to school was Broadway, where you seem to be more comfortable with more black uh, black youth there, and you got into sports. How how were um, or can you sort of describe the school days for us? A bit? Were they as black and white as I've made out? That one school was really bad, the second school was really good, or was it a bit more than that? I'm looking for my mad skipper. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird. The big man has gone. <laughs> 
Um, right, Great Bar School, Prince Albert again, uh, with Strictly Caribbean, uh, you know, all sorts of Caribbeans, <laughs> we were Caribbean. Secondary school, I went along to this school, my brother, a bit of a genius, went, I don't know why he went up there, he passed his 11 years, but he didn't go to King Edwards, I think there was too many passed that year or something, went up to this school, and I went along with him. To be honest, it was the first time I'd ever seen so many white people in my life. <laughs> and that's the truth. Um, my brother played rugby, so I went along every Saturday morning, you know, met, met the people, um, and went to that same school the next day. However, not being my brother, from the very first class, the very first minute, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, racism was alive and well in that community, in that school in particular. Um, as I says, in the book, a guy called Stephen Moore, I'm not sure if he's here or following me around or something, he greeted me with you know, an extensive, I didn't want to say it to be honest, you know, what does it matter? Lots of expletives that were racially motivated and then proceeded to try and rob me my lunch money, which was kind of the wrong thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he wouldn't do it now either, I think. <laughs> so I said, my first day, first lesson, I was banking on someone. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, that's pretty much my memory of that yeah. school, banging people out. Yeah. And that, but it had to be that, that was literally, you know, fight or, or die sort of thing. Well, it wasn't me that was doing anything. I was defending myself, you know. At no juncture was I on assault with anybody. However, there were groups of people that seemed to want to make their point and would follow us around. So, for example, one night I come out from a basketball match outside the gym, there's about 40 players, <coughs> all adults, in the playground, and there's like me and five of my mates. Uh, the PE teacher comes out, you know, gobs up, but we're in great bar. I live in Aston. These guys, they got chains, they've got everything, and you know, they're chanting their chants and doing their salutes and telling us what they're going to do to us, basically. So, to me, that was just one day in Great Bar. That there was, I don't know if anybody here went Great Bar, but that's the truth. I tell people, they always say, nah, but there are some people who went to Great Bar who would verify that I was hoping he was going to be here. He was not here yet. Um, yeah, Great Bar was horrible. And did, did that affect your studies as well? Having to deal with that racism and having to fight your way through, did that affect your studies or not? Ultimately, yes. That's kind of when I discovered the warrior. So fighting became standard, you know, to the point where I enjoyed it, to be honest. Yeah. But that seemed to change, going through the book, it seemed to change when you went to Broadway, you felt much more comfortable, you felt happy, you seemed happier within yourself. And I was going to ask you, that's where it seems to me you sort of started discovering sort of music, girls, you know, going out. Um, no. No? <laughs> right. Broadway was always there. So we passed Broadway. You know, we'd leave Great Bar and pass by Broadway anyway. Broadway was where all, I would say it was the Esau school, where all the new Caribbeans who didn't speak English very well went first. It used to be Canterbury Cross. So the people who went to Canterbury Cross, uh, like the, the generation above me, who came from Jamaica, they didn't speak English very well. They sent them to Canterbury Cross. When they assimilated, then they would go to Holt School and Broadway School was built in 1972 to take up the over spell. My sister went to Broadway. She even goes to the same school as me. Um, that school was a nice school. You know, there was no war. There wasn't, you know, gangs roaming around the place. It was, it was kind of a haven from surviving Great Bar all day, then getting to go to Broadway at night was, like I said. 
How old were you when you went to Broadway? I went there formally in the sixth form. Right. Okay. Was year 12 now. Um, but I've been at Broadway since second year. So when I actually, Great Bar finished at 3 o'clock, Broadway finished at 4.20. I'd catch the bus and be in Broadway at about 20 past three. Yeah. And I'd literally be in the classes, yeah. in people's classes, the teachers. Would you would let you? Well, eventually. You should just turn up and walk into the class. I actually went to that school. I didn't actually start there. You didn't have the uniform or anything like that? <laughs> so, so, again, I might be wrong on this, but reading, reading the book, this is, this is when you started driving. Yeah. And that's really perplexed me. So I think what, must have been 13, something like that. 12. 12. How on earth were you driving a car? I was driving at, at before that, but we bought a car when we were <laughs> No, I how, like, you how? You bought a car when you were 12, like, you know, you would do. My dad had a Morris Oxford. So we was practicing washing and cleaning skills from when we was relatively young. Those skills developed into it. Remember the milk, the milk first? Yeah, yeah. The milk man would come back at the front, he'd be by the door and I'd go up the road in the milk first. Um, yeah, we acquired skills as we went along. <laughs> and milk first, <laughs> So you literally you just jump, so you, you go to school, to, you go to a school that you didn't go to, and then you drive milk floats, and then that's how you let her drive. On the road. <laughs> and never stopped, no hassles. Yeah, no. Still driving. Wow, that's, that's insane, I can't imagine that. And, and again, there's a piece in the book, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, roughly about the same time, where you talk about playing records, uh, and you talk about the gramophone, and the, the needle dropping, and the, again, if you could just, you know, some people in this room might not know what gramophones are, we, have, we use our phones for, for to listen to the music a lot now. What was that experience like that? It seems to be quite a strong memory in terms of the book. It's what we see, our elders that we were young then, but like I said, my mum kind of raised other people who were older than us, my cousin's age, um, and they would set, this, would set the standards, so they bought records and listened to all sorts of stuff. Um, we were just kind of sitting there watching young at that time, uh, but again, that was, you know, influential on us, because mm. again, it shaped how we wanted to flow and we knew when bell buttons and all the other styles came in because the older guys would have them once. So as young people, just like today, I guess we wanted to have the same yeah. as the, the generation above us. But the gram is your modern day, uh, the old school iPad or iPhone then. So in the black community, I think most households bought a gram and then it evolved into Amstrad. <laughs> um, but the grams, again, there was a ranking with the grams. And the ultimate gram to have was the blue spoon. Mm -hmm. um, just like today. You know. I suppose that's the pioneer or something like that. Anyway. Um, so, you know, depending on whose house you went to, they would always take it today if they had a blue spot you knew you was going to be listening to music yeah. before you got there so it was just like that really could you touch it or did you just have to look at it and yeah well you had to put the records on no i mean but could you if it wasn't yours <laughs> no, <blue too. laughs> <laughs> but if it wasn't yours you were allowed to, i mean yeah. oh, i could never go anywhere near my mom's the records so, yeah. the records yeah. were the you know the thing that they didn't right. need to touch the ground you can touch you all the time but touching without the records was not much fun now so again, through the book, it, it seems, and you know, I'm not trying not to give too much away from the book. I don't know who's read it, who hasn't, but you can buy copies at, at the end, and it's honestly worth worth reading. But the community, the community that you, you've talked about, and there's just a cast of characters. It was almost like a, a fiction book with the, and I've just written a few of them down. You know, there's the Currens, uh, Ivor, uh, Bijar and Courtney, the Curries, the McCoys, the Wilkinsons, Keith Copeland and his family, uh, your, your extended family went at family parties. Sado, uh, it just seems a never-ending cast of people that you've been or known. And I wonder if you could just explain a few stories about, about those characters and how they influenced you or didn't influence you or if they're lifelong friends or not. Um, yeah, we had friends. Like I said, we grew up in an open house. You know, I don't know who is really my family and who is really my family because there were so many people there. Some of them were larger than I think. 
think I see them now and I still call them my cousins. So it was like that. My mum, like I said, was a guitar entrepreneur at the time as well, doing her various industries. Um, she had her posse. Uh, a lady called Miss Alva. I wish she was here. She's old now. But I remember, <laughs> you know, my mum and her psyche, because I used to call her many a day sitting there. My mum would be rattling and Miss Alva was like the person in the back who just came out with a joke every now and then. But it was constant. And, you know, they would do people bad, but we won't get <laughs> um, So, naturally, I said, we, as a family, I think, kind of open. You know, we bring our friends home. We don't really go to other people's houses. We bring all our friends home. Cause you know, like I said, if I come home from a party, you know, my friends are hungry, I go to my mum's. My mum would get up in the middle of the night and come and cook food for them. And she didn't really matter as long as it was my friends. So, as a result, we have lots of friends. I have friends just for getting cake. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go wrong with getting cake. No, they only know me because they want to my mum's cake. So, I have lots of people who just check me and they would always bring the cake up eventually. Um, but the music, like I said, we met a lot of people in music, sports as well. Yeah. But more importantly, Hansworth or Aston at the time. <coughs> it was a vibrant community. Um, you know, you couldn't go down the road. It, everybody knew everybody. Mm. If you was being nosy on the road, someone else would slap you in the head who knew your dad or something mm. like that or correct you. Um, it was rich. I knew people on every single mm. road. You know, 55 now, and I'm still living in Aston. So, mm. you know, I think it was it was not like it is now. It was very rich at the time. Like I said, there was a time when <coughs> I used to think Hansworth was a 24-hour city because you could literally get up at any point in time, get up and go out, and there was a party or a blues or somewhere to go. Mm. Something done all the time, every single night of the week. There wasn't a point when, you know, the word bored has never been a part of my vernacular. Um, I've never had a chance to be bored. The music, if it's not making music, it's going, watching my mates build their sound systems and, you know, hyping it up about how great they are and going along to support them or, you know, making music with other bands. Mm. Uh, going on tour. Because obviously we, we went on tour with like, UB40, you know, I know pretty much a lot of people. I don't really know them. I went on tour with them, mm. did some work with them. That's mm. what I say now. At the time we knew them, it was everything. Mm. Um, well, that, that area, that, that period of Hansworth, he said, you know, I think it was the sort of capital of reggae, really, in terms of the, the amount of bands that came out. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about Mike's, you know, you saw archive work. The amount of bands and the vibrancy were there. Do you, uh, do you think, and you just said you think it's changed. Any, any way you can clarify that? How do you think it's changed? Uh, it's changed, trust me. I think Birmingham's changed. At that time, it was predominantly Caribbean people that made up the BME sector. I think while there were a large group of Asians who came, Bangladeshi and Indians at the time, in terms of the percentage wise, now it's, there are very few black families left in Aston. Um, all the businesses are Asian. Um, you know, it's changed, it's not worse or better. Yeah, it's yeah, changed, it's changed so it's just different now. Um, I'm not sure, here are some of my young people. I'm glad they came. Uh, they're all trainee accountants. <laughs> I'm training them in some aspects of leadership and stuff. So I'm really happy to see them flattered. <laughs> um, you know, now there's a different community and different yeah. people. I mean, for us, there was the factory. My dad, for example, in his mind, it was go to school, leave school, get a job in the factory. And there wasn't really another narrative. Um, it wasn't the only thing we weren't being compelled to do that leave school and get a job was certainly fundamental. The type of work available or generally afforded to us at that time. When I left school, uh, I asked to be a car mechanic. Somehow I ended up doing a mechanical engineering apprenticeship instead. So I became a qualified engineer the day I finished it. 
-hmm. was the last day I did engineering. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but I started, so I finished. Yeah. And so uh, there's only a few, well, 10 minutes left, so I haven't really asked you about the music. Okay. And you didn't really want to talk about the church when you said earlier, but again, you know, reading the book, it seems to me that sort of music and church were, were inter intertwined uh, as you grew up. And, that was almost an introduction. You, know, you talked about the gramophone, but also church uh, was important in terms of listening, hearing, hearing music. So I just wondered uh, if you could again sort of, um, am, am I right in thinking that church and music went hand in hand, or was it you know one lead to the other? This thing's in the room, so I'm not forgetting. To me, church and music went hand in hand. can say anything in music. Um, you went to church to hear good music. I didn't go to church necessarily to hear the sermon when I was young. I went to church because there was lots of young people. It was vibrant and the music was booming. There were these, the band in Gibson Road, uh, one of the older churches, I think the bishop has just passed and in the last month or so. Um, it was a phenomenal church. It had a phenomenal vibe. People were all kind of my age who were playing the music. There's this guy called Trevor Johnson, absolute musical genius. He plays the piano. His brother Fitzroy Johnson plays the organ. Together, these guys would rock any stage. They wouldn't even need a drum. They're just absolutely brilliant musicians. And they were the key feature at Gibson Old Church in those days. So people were rocking in the aisles, I'm sorry. People were there for yeah. religion, yeah. but they were there for the music yeah. too. And if they say they weren't lying because yeah. the music was too good not to notice. Well, music's often <laughs> considered as a you know almost a religious experience. You know, you go to the graves and uh, gigs, and people talk about it as almost uh, being being religious. So, the church played a, a role in terms of the music. Then you got into it. How did you sort of start playing? You mentioned. So your sister's piano, and you mentioned you know some of the musicians you heard in the church. You mentioned some of the sound systems. How did you start getting into music as a way of you know either expressing yourself or was it for enjoyment, or was it actually this could be a good career for me? Right, the amplifier and stuff my mum bought me. We you know, picked away. That gave us the ability to go and play with our neighbours who went to that church and then they had their own little amplifier and guitar so me and my brother were on this side, they were on that side. Uh, at church we learnt enough to be able to jam along occasionally with the guys at church. My brother enjoyed church more than I did I think and he wasn't particularly into music in any given way except appreciating music whereas I had a passion for creating music. Um, so I enjoyed playing with the guys at church. They were really like 10 years ahead of me in terms of now, like, probably 20 years yeah. even now, in terms of their ability. So I needed to find a group yeah. that were you know, similar yeah, to yeah. my level. The school, uh, my mate Ivan Dowdy, he and I played basketball for England together. Um, and my other mate, Herman Wilson, he's from Small League. He, again, another basketball <coughs> player, his only pistol. He was a starting player for England back in the day. Um, we went out occasionally. Ivor told me about this band that had started at Broadway. I went along to listen. That was it. I was in. Just like that? Just like that. Do you have a you can just turn up anywhere. You can go to classes where you're not supposed to be. <laughs> Milk folks where you're not supposed to be driving. Personal rooms where you're not supposed to be just everyone tips it. <laughs> so, so tell us a bit more about Unity then. Uh, again, I mean, someone I'm aware of, but, you know, it's not really told, you know, people talk about musical Unity still, Pulse and UB40 particularly. It clips a little bit Bashara a little bit, but where were Unity? There's African star corners. There's so many bands going at that time. Unity. Uh, yeah, we were all right at first. You know, we had a little lovers rock roots, a kind of rockers type style. Um, <coughs> you know, 13, 14 years old. So How old were you when you started? 13 years About 15 people in the group. Girls, guys. Every 
this song would be a different drummer or a different keyboard, but it was very ad hoc in terms of the way it started. But eventually, you know, we lost some people and people made the decision to go for it. Um, we got a little sign, we got a few gigs and we played. You know, I loved it. Uh, we played for 10 years. In that 10 years, we went from a rocker's roots thing into a heavy metal band. Mm. And that's the truth. Mm. So, like, well, was so that a good thing or a bad thing? It was a good thing. <coughs> we were the only trip rock band in the world. <laughs> 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 and these guys could really play. Like it says, Ozzy Osbourne went to our junior school. So rock 